Thank you very much. It's a, it's a real pleasure and a, and a privilege to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I think the, uh, when, when my plane landed this, this afternoon, I was reminded of when I first landed to, 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 to be here as a graduate student in 19, believe it or not, in 1972. Um, it's a long time ago, but I've been back many times and I hope to be able to continue that in the future. I've always left Cambridge being a little smarter than when I arrived. And I hope that will also continue. Uh, so again, thank you for the invitation. I, um, I'm not sure I can add a great deal to what was said earlier by my friend General Naumann uh, and of course um, our VIP uh, leader from the European Parliament, uh, Reinhard Bütikofer. Uh, they covered a lot of ground. Let me, uh, let me just touch on a few issues, including, of course, on what happened in Munich uh, just a week or so ago. But before I do that, uh, you know, when I, when I read the title, The U.S. and Germany Drifting Apart, I have to tell you that that is not exactly uh, a new invention, this question. I remember when I was a young diplomat in the uh, late 70s, based in Washington, D.C., one of my jobs was drafting speeches for the ambassador. And my most favorite speech was, are we drifting apart? <laughs> so, and of course the answer was no, not really, but we have to watch out. Um, <clears throat> and I guess that's more or less what we need to do today. Uh, one of the important things um, that you have to learn if you try to be a good analyst of international relations or if you try to be a good diplomat is you have to work very hard to understand exactly what you see and what you hear. And that's not always easy and the best story which I, I thought I should share with you before I uh, talk about a few more serious things is what happened to the Pope, the German Pope, uh, a few years ago when he visited his home country, Germany. The Pope uh, had spent a day or so in his home, old hometown, Munich, and then they invited him to ride in a brand new BMW 7 Series limousine to his next stop. I guess it was supposed to be Stuttgart. So the driver the driver went on to the autobahn, at which point the Pope leaned forward and said, young man, you may be aware that when I was based here in Munich, I was still driving my own car. In Rome, they don't let me drive. And of course, I, never, I will never have a chance to drive this kind of car, so would you mind if we just <laughs> change seats? So the young driver said, your holiness, uh, uh, as you please. So he pulls over, the Pope gets behind the wheel, the young man modestly gets into the back seat, and the Pope hits the Autobahn. And sure enough, after about 15 minutes, runs into a Bavarian state police radar speed trap. <laughs> and his car is being stopped by, the, by this policeman. The policeman approaches the car, looks inside, looks again, and then decides to call his, his boss <laughs> and, and says, Chief, before I make a mistake here, I, I caught this car, you know, speeding, but I think this may be a kind of a VIP situation. <laughs> the chief says, what are you talking about, young man? In Germany, before the law, everybody is equal. If this guy is speeding, I don't care who that is. Give him a ticket. The young man looks inside the car again, calls his chief again and says, Chief, 
I don't think I should do this. I think it would be a big mistake. The chief says, but who is the person in the car? The young man says, chief, that's the problem. I don't know who it is. What I do know is his driver is the pope. <laughs> so, you know, let's try to understand exactly uh, what it is that we see and then make sure we understand what's behind it. Um, regarding the recent Munich Security Conference, I could give you a long presentation about what happened, what did not happen, but I thought the best summary that I found over the last week or so, two weeks, uh, was actually written by a, by a fellow foreign policy analyst who may be known to, I'm sure, quite a number of you, Dmitry Trenin, a Russian who works with Carnegie in Moscow. He was also in Munich and he, he wrote a kind of a blog and I'd just like to quote the last two or three sentences uh, because I, I totally agree with it. He, the, it starts with the following sentence, Wolfgang Ischinger, Germany's former deputy, etc., etc., uh, should feel pleased. Yes, Dimitri is right, I feel pleased. Munich has become the place for open dialogue and discreet exchanges on security issues around the world. This dialogue itself is an emblem of Germany stepping up as a political, not just economic power with a global reach. And there were about as many uniformed Bundeswehr officers in the audience as those with the US military insignia. This does not mean, however, a quote unquote militar militarization, unquote, of Germany's foreign policy, as President Gauck has said, this is the best Germany that has ever existed in history, and he is right. End of quote from Dimitri. I think that summarizes it quite nicely. Um, we had a, a, an interesting um, meeting. Many remarks have already been made about, about um, the Gauck speech and, and other speeches about responsibility and, uh, and partnership and leadership and so on and so forth. Um, let me, um, before I talk briefly about these specific issues, um, let me say a word about the question whether we are drifting apart. What is the state of play? in the transatlantic world. Um, actually, I agree with what Roger Cohen wrote in the New York Times just a day or two ago. Uh, this is as bad a moment, if I may quote, as there has been in German-American relations in the post-war years. In fact, I remember uh, I wrote myself also in the New York Times back in November I said, transatlantic relations have reached a low point not, since, not seen since the Iraq war, which is more or less the same, the same thing. Now, why is this so bad? Uh, and why, can't, why have we great difficulty shrugging it off? I think one element is that, for example, the crisis over the Pershing II deployment in the 1980s in Europe, or the crisis over the disagreement whether or not we should go, we should intervene militarily in Iraq 11 years ago. Um, those were policy differences. And once the policy difference was resolved or put behind us, we were able to go back to business as usual, essentially. Uh, in both the Pershing missile crisis and in the case of the Iraq dispute, there were lots of people demonstrating in the streets of Germany and elsewhere for that matter, who did not agree with a certain policy. I have not seen anyone protesting in the streets of Berlin against the NSA 
It's not mass protest that we're talking about here. That's the interesting thing. There is no mass protest. So why is it so serious? I believe it is so serious because this time it's not the student body that revolts or disagrees with the policies adopted by the leaders. This time it's the leader herself, in this case Angela Merkel, who is really angry and who lets the world and her citizens know that she is angry. She is angry because she has reason to suspect that there is no respect. It's a question of respect and it's a question of trust. Now, just to conclude a thought on, on that point, when you think, and that brings me back to the Munich Security Conference, which was first started in 1963, when old man Ewald von Kleist, who founded and created the Munich Conference, when he invited some American friends who happened to be US senators and uh, policymakers or academics, small group of people in 1963, what was the issue? The issue was essentially also a question of trust. The issue was, can we Germans trust that the Americans can deliver on what they are now telling us is a credible defense strategy called mutual assured destruction. Can we trust our, our big ally who has promised to offer a nuclear protective umbrella to us? And that was a big debate. It was resolved in part by the United States offering to her European allies a kind of a participatory role in nuclear planning, called the Nuclear Planning Group, which exists to this day, um, which helped build trust about the policy and whether it would work if, if and when a crisis erupted. In a, in a certain way, I believe we have a similar situation today. There is a loss of trust, there's a lack of trust, um, and we will need to find ways, also institutional and procedural ways, to, to try to repair things. I am interested uh, uh, in proposals such as the one made, and it was mentioned an hour ago, uh, by the new German foreign minister um, about a, a kind of an institutional discussion forum between the two sides of the Atlantic, I believe that um, um, a kind of an institutional arrangement between the US Congress and the European Parliament, but maybe also the German Bundestag, could also go a long way and provide much better explanations as the kind of government-to-government -government discussions which have turned out to be rather less fruitful than expected or than hoped for uh, over the uh, last few months. So I think uh, creative thinking about track two initiatives, about parliamentary uh, parliaments working together, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that's the way to move forward to try to rebuild uh, trust. And to, and to limit or uh, repair the kind of alienation that we have seen develop over this, uh, these last few months. I think it's, it is really quite serious. Um, second point I wanted to make is about the state of mind of Germans. When West Germany was founded, at the end of the 1940s. The West German Republic was essentially just like the United States when it was founded at the end of the 18th century, an anti-status quo kind of institution. The United States was created to get rid of, you know, the British, the, 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 the English crown. And so it was anti-status quo. And West Germany's constitution, the Grundgesetz, uh, had 
as its ultimate goal, you know, overcoming the status quo of, of having two German states uh, on our territory. In 1990, of course, that goal of overcoming the status quo was achieved. And uh, I'll give you my short version. I could present it in slightly more academic terms, but that would take too long. I believe, I believe that since 1990, Germans have started a love affair with the status quo. They increasingly believed and continue to believe that now that we have had so much change, World War I, World War II, uh, the Berlin Wall, the Berlin Wall ta being taken down, rebuilding East Germany, etc., uh, the enlargement of the European Union, uh, leave us alone. We've had too much turmoil. We don't want more EU enlargement. Uh, don't talk to us about Turkey, please. Uh, uh, don't talk to us. Rainer well, Pütikofer explained this, I thought, very well. Don't talk to us about military activities in faraway places. First of all, it doesn't work. Second, why should we? Um, is it not better if we can just be left alone. Uh, this is the kind of state of mind which leads to the kinds of polling results that were quoted, uh, where Germans express a great deal of skepticism uh, with regard to a stronger, quote unquote, military uh, role. So I believe that this is a leadership challenge. I believe that I have tended to believe that uh, the Germans will get rid of their obsessive love affair with the status quo only if they are told by their own government, by, the, by, by Germany's own leaders, that if we don't adapt change as our motto, adapting to a changing globalized world in every single uh, area of, of, of activity, we will be left behind. Uh, we're not going to be the world champion of export uh, uh, goods if we don't if continue to adapt ourselves. In other words, we need to overcome the love affair with the status quo. That is why I am very happy about the speeches made in Munich, because I believe that's a beginning uh, of a reflection that maybe this love affair isn't good enough. Um, and I hope that we will move forward on that basis. Now, I'm not going to talk much more um, about the speeches by President Gauck, et, et cetera. Um, I want to just make one point, uh, or emphasize a point which was made earlier also. It is wrong to limit this debate uh, in a way that it focuses only on the question of military activities. I think the question is a much broader question. Let me tell you what I, for example, happen to believe what the German government should have done or could do to yesterday, today, or tomorrow. And this is not, not a, has nothing to do with military, uh, with the deployment of military force. I believe the, the leadership countries of the European Union, Germany, France, the UK, Poland, a few others, uh, should not have left the future of Ukraine in the hands of a relatively powerless EU commissioner by the name of Stefan Füle. Stefan Füle is a good friend of mine. I have great respect for him. He's, I think he's done a, a good job. But I don't believe that President Putin believes that Stefan Füle is kind of his level. Uh, and, and that is why I happen to believe that Angela Merkel, Francois Hollande, and a few other of these guys of, at that level should have confronted President Putin. Three months ago, six months ago, she have told him, this is our strategic point. And you're going to have a lot, of, a, lot of angry, a lot of anger on our side if we don't start seeing eye to eye on this issue. That is what I think 
we should include in terms of leadership activities. We can't expect Lithuania and Portugal to come up with the leadership initiatives. They will be happy to agree and to uh, follow, but this is certainly something which Paris, London, uh, and, and certainly also Berlin uh, need to work out uh, and, and propose and try to convince the rest of the EU that that may be a decent and a good way to move forward. Um, you know, and the, the, and the other point I wanted to make about the Gauk speech, etc. Don't forget that none of these speeches are about the greater glory of Germany. I'm saying this because I'm hearing from some of my Jewish friends, including in this country, and I want to be very specific about this point. I'm hearing from some of my Jewish friends a kind of a concern. Oh, what are the Germans up to here? You know, what is this all about? These were very similar voices of concern came up when Germany was united 22 years ago or 24 years ago. Uh, I think we must make crystal clear that this is not about German power uh, and auch nicht Deutsche an die Front. It is about trying to provide the kind of leadership that will make the EU a more effective and a more credible partner for the United States and a more credible actor in world affairs. Do I have three more minutes, Nick? I think my time is more or less up, but give me, give me three or four minutes. If I, if I could. Um, I want to make one, one or two final points. Um, what, needs to, what needs to happen, or what should happen, both in the German debate and in the EU, if we want to go beyond the rhetoric? Well. A lot needs to happen. I will only mention one thing. Um, when I look at the traditions of the United States, you have not only the quadrennial defense review, you have all kinds of reports and blue ribbon commissions and, and, and reports and papers mandated by, by Congress. Uh, there is an abundance of formal government explanations of what US strategy, foreign policy, defense policy is all about. The Federal Republic of Germany has afforded itself the luxury of not writing a single paper of that nature since 2006. We have had the last white paper uh, produced in 2006 and the world you will all agree with me, has changed significantly since 2006. If we don't explain to our voters what the objectives, the means, the resources, the methods of our security and defense policy are, no wonder the skepticism of the population will not dwindle. And my last point is, only if we know what we as Germans believe should happen in and with and through the EU, can we help write a new strategy paper for the EU. It was also mentioned. Javier Zolana produced a strategy paper in 2003. Um, I strongly believe that the European Union needs a strategic document in 2014 or no later than 2015, maybe after the new uh, commission, etc., cetera, is, is inaugurated. Uh, I believe that should be a major first task for Lady Ashton's successor and for the new leadership of the, of the, uh, of the commission. Uh, finally, to conclude, um, we've had these heart-wrenching debates in Munich with Lakhtar Brahimi telling us everything about the catastrophic situation in Syria, uh, we have had to, un to understand once again that between the United States and Russia and the European Union,
the Cold War isn't still really over. We still regard each other with, um, with mistrust. Uh, we can't get our act together. We have not been able to get our act together on Ukraine, certainly not on Syria and on a number of other issues. This is why, and, and also not on, on arms control, including nuclear arms control, which is why I believe that working in the direction of a Euro-Atlantic security community as a long-term goal is going to be the central task for NATO in the future. That, that is what is left to do for the Western community with Russia, figuring out a way that will, would allow a grand bargain, a grand compromise. Um, the other question which I hope to, to, be, to be dealing with more, more, in a more focused way at next year's Munich Security Conference um, is Africa. If we are sending our soldiers, not only German soldiers, but others uh, into these newly developed African crisis situations, I think we shouldn't do that in a kind of a um, haphazard way. Most Germans have never, don't even know where the Central African Republic is. And I think we need to explain to our uh, citizens why this is actually important to Europe, to European security, and for that matter, also to Germany. So we're going to try to broaden our perspective beyond the classic uh, areas of, of um, transatlantic security. And that, if we do that successfully, we're not going to drift apart. Thank you very much.